Bhakti The Vedanta Sutra or Brahma Sutra compiled by Sri Vyasadeva is the full deliberation of the impersonal absolute feature and it is accepted as the most exalted philosophical exposition in the world. It covers the subject of eternity and the methods are scholarly. So there cannot be any doubt about the transcendental scholarship of Vyasadeva. So why should he lament? I was born in the darkest ignorance. My spiritual master opened my eyes with the torch of knowledge. I offer my respectful obeisances unto him and all members of Sri Grandpa. As we've been beginning um, the Srimad Bhagavatam over again, first canto, um, one of the um, one of the things that's at the beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam is some very nice statements about um, the value and the position of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And uh, there's some verses that we often chant before reciting this Srimad Bhagavatam. And they are particularly pertinent to uh, our study of this verse. So today I'd like to read through um, some of those verses and uh, we'll talk about how they and this verse actually are extremely tied together. <laughs> Before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the very means of conquest, one should offer respectful obeisances unto the personality of Godhead, Narayan, unto Nara Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, unto Mother Sarasvati, the goddess of learning, and unto Srila Vyasadeva, the author. Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, who is the Paramatma, super soul, in everyone's heart, and the benefactor of the truthful devotee, cleanses desire for material enjoyment from the heart of the devotee, who has developed the urge to hear his messages, which in themselves are virtuous when properly heard, and chanted by regular attendance in classes on the Bhagavatam and by rendering of service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely destroyed and loving service unto the personality of Godhead who is praised with transcendental songs is established as an irrevocable fact. As soon as irrevocable loving service is established in the heart, the effects of nature's modes of passion and ignorance, such as lust, desire, and hankering, disappear from the heart. Then the devotee is established in goodness, and he becomes completely happy. Thus established in the mode of unalloyed goodness, the man whose mind has been enlivened by contact with devotional service to the Lord gains positive, scientific knowledge of the personality of Godhead in the stage of liberation from all material association. Thus, the knot in the heart is pierced and all misgivings are cut to pieces. The chain of fruitive actions is terminated when one, when one sees the self as master. Certainly, therefore, since time immemorial, all transcendentalists have been rendering devotional service to Lord Krishna, the personality of Godhead, with great delight, because such devotional service is enlivening to the self. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated, this Bhagavad Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality, distinguished from illusion, for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam, compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity, is sufficient in itself for God-realization. 
what is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Oh, expert and thoughtful men, who relish Srimad Bhagavatam, the mature fruit of the desired tree of Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadev Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarian juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. So in the earlier chapters of this canto, right at the beginning of the Bhagavatam, we've been told the value of the Bhagavatam. And interesting, through these verses that I've just read, we hear that, that, there's, um, that there's aspects of happiness, right? We've heard that... Um, We've heard the uh, aspect that there's uh, cutting the knot in the heart, um, getting through and wrecking the material miseries, um, establishing in goodness and becoming completely happy. Uh, we've heard uh, that uh, misgiving, yeah, I had that one, the misgivings are cut to pieces. So we've seen that this, that the aspect of being happy is a desirable goal that is being promoted through the Srimad Bhagavatam. And that there is, um, this is part of what can provide welfare for all and uproot the threefold miseries. And um, the interesting thing though, is the first person whose story we're, we're hearing, um, we're hearing about, uh, we're gonna hear about Narada Muni, but before that, we're um, hearing a little bit about the state in which Narada Muni found Vyasadeva is he was not happy. In fact, he was said to be despondent. And uh, so despondent is an interesting word. Uh, it's, it means a loss of hope and courage. Um, it's like you're sad and you don't see any future other than sadness. So the despondency of being a loss of hope, a loss of courage, courage related to the word for heart, right? So losing heart. Now that seems to be quite a contrast to what we read from the previous verses, where it was talking about enlivening and relishing and great delight and completely happy. Um, so that is, uh, there's a contrast here that we need to explore a little bit. Um, so if you are despondent, you are very unhappy because you've been experiencing difficulties that you think you will not be able to overcome. You don't see any better future. You don't see uh, anything useful. And the other thing that uh, Narada Muni says to the Asadeva, he says, why should you be despondent? And he says, thinking that you are undone. This word undone, you know, like we, we know that you can undo a knot or un, undo a fastening, but it also had a meaning that we don't use much anymore of feeling like everything's wrecked. Um, again, it's, it's tied very much to the uh, despondent um, definition. So dictionary definition of thinking you're undone to be without hope for the future, having experienced great disappointment, um, loss of money, etc. You know, like loss of reputation, loss of, you know, everything's gone, so you feel undone. Um, we also have a word that's related to that, you know, such and such was his undoing. So that, you know, the actual impetus of, of what made him undone Something was his undoing, which is, both of them are very interesting because the, they have that prefix un in front. So undone and undoing implies that that's not the natural state. That's a change from the natural state. Something's been undone. Um, so in this verse, uh, Narada Muni asks 
Why should you be despondent in spite of all this, thinking that you are undone, my dear Prabhu? Interesting question, because he doesn't really expect an answer. He's not searching for an answer or expecting that, but saying, I don't know, please tell me. This is a kind of question called a rhetorical question, where you, it's phrased as a question, but it's not really a search for an answer. It's actually a dramatic way of making a point, taking the statement, turning it into a question, and that makes it a little more noticeable than your average statement. So rhetorical question, um, why are you like this, my dear Prabhu, is not really, uh, please, please tell me what's on your mind. It's not that. It's like, you shouldn't be like this. <laughs> There's, uh, you know, this is, this is not, uh, you're, this is not proper. Don't be like this. And it's interesting because in the verses that we read, I, there were, I think, two other rhetorical questions. Um, one related to the, uh, the, the scripture. Um, what is the need of any other scripture? This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? That is, again, a rhetorical question. That's not a search for an answer. Please tell me what needs, what other scriptures are needed? What, what do we, what else do we need? It's saying we don't need anything else, but it's phrasing it in this rhetorical question. There's no need for anything else. And um, I think there was one other uh, in the in the lead up to all of this. Okay. So um, Narada Muni, uh, ex first he says, your inquiries were full and your studies were also well fulfilled. You did a good job. There's no doubt that you have prepared a great and wonderful work. Yeah, it's, it's good stuff you've been doing. And then you have fully delineated the subject of impersonal Brahman, as well as the knowledge derived therein. You, you did your job, 100%. Great work, student. And so then, but then the question, why aren't you happy about it? Why didn't this make you happy? Why were you despondent in spite of all this? thinking that you are undone. And in the purport, Srila Prabhupada echoes the rhetorical question at the end. So why should he lament? Um, so there cannot be any doubt about the value of the work he has done. It's not because he failed in his project. His project was well done. He's getting a good score here from his spiritual master. And yet he's not doing the victory dance. He's not even particularly happy. He's actually despondent. So um, what we understand from all of this is that there is something more. And the verses that we read from um, the beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam, this Srimad Bhagavatam is the very means of conquest. Uh, this cleanses desire for material enjoyment from the heart. Uh, it, th this the classes on the Bhagavatam and service to the pure devotee can clear what's troublesome to the heart. So, um, Vyasa Dave hadn't got to that point yet. He had not started to give us Srimad Bhagavatam. He, he knew it. Um, you know, he didn't need to go for, you know, another full lifetime of, uh, of research, he knew these, these, these factors, but he wasn't fully satisfied until he was able to give it to the world. And, um, so this is, this is an interesting aspect of, of being unhappy and so interesting that right at the beginning, you know, there's the, the verses we read about the Srimad Bhagavatam, basically prescription for being happy. And then the first person that we see of whose, whose story we're going to get is, is an unhappy person. And he's so unhappy, he's despondent. He doesn't see a future. He, he, his, his hope is, is gone. And that's an interesting 
uh, is interesting because we did learn in the previous chapter that he had a hint of what the problem was. He had a hint that it might be because he has not actually said very much about this amazing personality, Krishna. He hasn't really pointed um, to what the, uh, the ultimate goal of life is. And so along comes Narada Muni, who has, of course, the interesting ability to show up at any time to move the plot along. Um, so Narada Muni has appeared and is also slightly chastising him for not being happy and is going to point out to him, yeah, you know really what you need to do. That's coming up in the next couple of verses. So um, one, uh, one aspect of, you know, not being happy is, of course, our situation in the material world. Mostly people aren't very happy. And if they are somewhat happy, it's short lived. And so unfortunately, um, this is one major condition in the world is to not actually be very happy and to try to use material um, methods to try to become happy, which, you know, as the Bhagavatam points out, is mis misdirected and misguided. That's not a good, um, a good path. And so then in between, there's happiness that um, is experienced by the practitioner of bhakti, which is, you know, religion is joyfully performed, um, you know, knowing that we have a dear most friend is Krishna, he's living in our heart in the, in the form of super soul, he cares about us, he wants us to be happy. So there's the, there's the there's that happiness. Then there's a, um, a sadness that I feel unqualified to talk about actually, but I think when we talk about despondency, uh, we almost need to at least look at it a little tiny bit. Maybe in this assembly, there will be some comments that are worthy of, it, of this topic, although mine would not be, um, is the, the tears of the gopis in separation from Krishna. How is that not just despondency. So we see that a despondency meant a loss of hope and courage, uh, um, being unhappy that there are difficulties that you think you will not ever be able to overcome. The gopis tears and separation from Krishna is not described as despondency. And one of the things that we can see about that is because it's out of love. It's out of separation for someone who does still exist. It's not that there is no hope. That person is still there. That, and to have there, not with them, but still existing. And so to have um, the uh, memories and belief that that person is still around somewhere, not with me, but somewhere, is not the same as despondency. And it is a very great focus on the, um, the beloved rather than focus on oneself and how a rotten life is. And so apparently, I, I of course am not in personal realization of this, um, but that is a very, um, it, it actually makes you happy. It, may, it makes them happy to be constantly thinking of Krishna in their heart, happy in a sad way. So, so this, this amazing separation from the beloved that is constant meditation on the beloved is, has, a, has, a, has a joy all of its own to be able to just surrender that much. And uh, uh, the Lord can do whatever he wants to me. He can, he can leave me alone or he can crush me or he can do whatever he wants and I'm fine with it because I know who he is and I love him. So that's um, a different kind of sadness than the despondency or the um, threefold miseries effects or, or any of that. So um, I felt that that needed to be touched on, although of course um, I'm not capable of 
speaking much on that topic. Um, so we have reached the point where we should probably have some contributions from the um, assembly here. I'll just read the verse again. You have fully delineated the subject of impersonal Brahman, as well as the knowledge derived therefrom. Why should you be despondent in spite of all this, thinking that you are undone, my dear Prabhu? And Srila Prabhupada's short purport, the Vedanta Sutra or Brahma Sutra compiled by Sri Vyasadeva is the full deliberation of the impersonal absolute feature, and it is accepted as the most exalted philosophical exposition in the world. It covers the subject of eternity, and the methods are scholarly. So there cannot be any doubt about the transcendental scholarship of Vyasadeva. So why should he lament? Any comments, complaints, Mother 